I'm Sharon Min Chow here with Larry Eif, who is the general manager of Chevron's Pipelines, and there's a lot of them. And he, my new buddy Larry <laughs> here, is giving us first time access to take a look at your monitoring stations, how you kind of keep an eye on thousands of miles of pipelines and how you keep them safe. So this is very exciting. Please. Yes, let's go in. Literally not seen before to outside eyes. Correct. Okay. And what are we looking at down here? So this is our control center. So from mm -hmm. here is where we actually remotely control our pipelines. So pipelines are integral to the energy system in, in America, quite honestly, in the globe. Mm -hmm. And so from here is where we can remotely start and stop. We also monitor pressure, have leak detection. Um, it's really our central hub to make sure that we reliably and safely deliver the products to the marketplace and the people. And I see you have, it looks like about maybe nine workstations or so here. How are these broken up? How are these? Yeah, certainly so regionally. So these ones on the top side over here, that is um, <clears throat> our CP Chem, so Chevron mm -hmm. Phillips Chemical. Mm -hmm. uh, we have one for feedstocks and one for the, um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, chem for the product, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, then behind that, we have the Gulf of Mexico, so that's really focused in, in that region. The two on this side are our West Coast products and Rockies that are really doing mm -hmm. the things that we do on the West Coast. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we have a power console back here where we're operating uh, power uh, assets out in California. And then a leak and intrusion detection uh, console where we're monitoring live cameras and have leak detection tools that we're making sure that mm -hmm. we don't have any problems. Okay, so it's literally broken down either by region or by task. As Correct, it were. they're okay. all region except for the LIDS console, the, okay. leak, the leak and intrusion detection console. Okay. And just while we're up here, um, I know we were chatting about this a little bit earlier, but this used to be the Enron? This used to be the Enron building, and this was actually their trading floor that Enron used this as a trading floor. So um, what that meant is they had a lot of the infrastructure, mm -hmm. IT, power backup, uh, that's essential for a control center. So like I said, we have to run 24-7, uh, <clears throat> day in, day out. Uh, and so that's really critical is we gotta have the right infrastructure to do that. So it's regulated by TSA, so uh, mm -hmm. to ensure that we don't have any cyber instances. And so that and also sorry, helps just with the- Just interrupting, TSA as in transportation safety? Yes. Just so, like at the airport? Just like at the okay. airport. Right. But they also monitor all the critical infrastructure where we could have uh, threats from outside parties uh, getting into infrastructure and airports, et cetera. Okay, all righty. So, uh, bit of history here and not any just happenstance that you picked up the Enron trading floor all of it infrastructure is useful it's useful to, for yeah, it yes yeah, to some what of you it's been upgraded but yeah it's very much useful okay. in terms of the layout and, and what we're able to support from our backup power side etc yeah all of that energy and information going back and forth so uh, big issue of course is the leak detection the safety aspect the lids uh, desk Talk to me about that. How do you guys monitor for potential issues, problems? So we have multiple ways that we're looking when it's active mm -hmm. in terms of leaks. So one, we're measuring, we're uh, analyzing the, the <clears throat> operational data to make mm -hmm. sure that we don't see any anomalies and the pressures and flows that we're seeing are what we expect to see. From that LIDS console, we're actually using cameras. So we have thermal cameras uh, that are able to detect if we have a uh, temperature differential mm -hmm. of three degrees. Let's would, lean over here. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Um, three degrees plus or minus would notify the console to where they would uh, take a look at it and make sure there's nothing uh, wrong there. Mm -hmm. um, additionally, as we talked, our Gulf of Mexico assets are underwater, right? But <clears throat> one of the threats there is if we have a ship that may have an anchor, anchor down. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we monitor kind of all the traffic around our pipelines. If we see a, tra uh, see a vessel that's kind of stopped or just slow crawling that may be dragging an anchor, we'll notify the Coast Guard who notifies the vessel. We've actually had that happen a couple of times where we've been able to prevent uh, an anchor from hitting a pipeline. You have operations in Southern California. Big headlines now, of course, the wildfires. Has that impacted you guys at all yet? Yeah, so that's been no impact to our operation thus far. Mm -hmm. um, we have taken precautions precautionary measures to ensure that um, we're prepared in the event that those fires head towards us. And so that's another thing we do at that mm -hmm. console there is we actually monitor through uh, <clears throat> NOAA and other sites of where wildfires go. Mm -hmm. um, so even when it's smaller ones, we're able to know like, hey, we have a potential threat that we may need to take action on. 
and what do you do ahead of time in case something should happen? So our field teams have gotten together with everyone, they talk through the scenario, mm -hmm. and so in this instance, we put fire protection where we could. So if we think about that system, it's underground, but we may have a pit or a vault is what we call it, where there's a valve underneath the ground. And so we've gone into those and filled them with water, then covered them with a steel plate and put um, sand on top so that if that fire comes over, it has less potential to impact that pipeline. Okay, so right, the heat. So Correct, yeah, hopefully melts. protects the heat, yep. And then if it's an above ground set of valves? So above ground, if it's in some of those areas, um, we've taken fire protection blankets that we're able to wrap those pipes in. Mm -hmm. They're normally exposed because that's not normally a typical threat we mm -hmm. go through. But so at home, if you think about when we're wrapping our pipes because of freeze, then we're doing something very similar there in terms of trying to wrap it in case that fire comes over so we're protected. Okay. How many folks do you have, controllers do you have? And, you know, what kind of, what kind of training do they need? How, how, does, how does that work? Yeah, so roughly all together of the controllers to make the 24-7 run, we have around 40, 45 uh, controllers. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and they come from a diverse set of backgrounds. We've mm -hmm. got veterans, we've got former teachers. Um, and when we think about how, what it takes to become a controller, then we get the, the applicants that come in. The first step that they have to go through is they take a test. Um, so they take a test to really check their aptitude. Not necessarily do they understand oil and gas. This is really more of can they critically think through situations? Can they multitask? Do they have the right level of communication and action when they're hit with a different mm -hmm. parameters? And uh, training is almost the better part of a year, six, nine months? Yeah, it's six or nine months to wow. get trained and pass mm -hmm. through the certification. Wow. And the shifts, what's the work day like? Shifts, so here we run 12-hour shifts. Um, and it's seven days a week, so these guys are seven on, seven off. So after they've had their uh, seven, seven on, uh, mm -hmm. they'll be off for seven days and they'll come back on the opposite shift. So we just run two shifts, a day and a night shift. Wow, all right. And uh, backup locations? God forbid. Yeah, we do. So okay. we have some back. We have strategic backup locations. Uh, one here in the event that uh, we can't occupy this center that's close within mm -hmm. the Houston area, and then we have one a few hours away. If you think about where it's out of the path of any potential hurricane impacts. Okay. How many miles of pipeline are you guys responsible for? How much product uh, goes through them? Just so it's a two million, the equivalent of about two million barrels a day of uh, nice. production through there, or crude or products, uh, and that spans over 3,500 miles of pipe in the U.S. That's our U.S. footprint. Now we have a gym in our office, right, in the basement, but I do not have one on my newsroom floor. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Why do you guys have gym equipment? Right next to your workstations. Yeah, so I mentioned earlier that like, this is a regulatory environment, and so part of our, we have what they call control room management plan, uh, and part of that is uh, fatigue management. So we use this, it's not necessarily for uh, a total workout, it's just to get the blood flowing. If you think about when a guy's working graveyards, um, mm -hmm. he can come over here for a few minutes and just do a couple exercises, stretch out, yeah. make sure that get we don't get too reps tired. In. Yeah. yeah, alrighty. You, you would tell me a story that uh, sometimes in the graveyard shift, uh, they'll drag the elliptical over to yeah so we have one console that we can transfer mm -hmm. control to and so there are times at night um, mm -hmm. they'll drag the elliptical and maybe just go five or ten minutes just again to get the blood flowing where they can still kind of monitor what's going on at that station okay wow and all of this used to be in separate locations but you have now brought them all here huh? yeah so if we think back around 20 years ago mm -hmm. then um, <clears throat> each of the regions kind of had their own local center um, mm -hmm. and so with the advancement of technology with communication increases through or in, increase mm -hmm. in cellular and other formats we've been able to centrally locate here so it allows us to kind of leverage off of the consoles okay all right well I appreciate it um, I have one other thing yeah Tell okay, me. so um, another thing that we do is we do inline inspections. Uh, and so by doing that, we put a tool inside of the pipe and it's got monitors and sensors on it and a computer and we run that through the pipe and it's able to um, determine what, if we have any de defects and that would determine do we need to do an immediate repair or just monitor that situation. And so that's been going on since like the late 1990s or early 1990s uh, that that's been an industry tool and it continues to evolve as technology improves. Okay, so the, you were saying that, uh, I guess you call that a pig? Yes, Some of it's a pig. Folks have I probably, probably heard said that. ILI, it's inline mm -hmm. inspection tool. Industry, they'll call them p smart pigs. So there's pigs that you go to just clean out a pipe and then there's a smart pig that's doing all the measurement. That smart pig has its own computer chip. It does. <laughs> and it's recording it's everything. Amazing, yes. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Mr. Ike. Right, we appreciate you. the tour. This is, uh, it's been fascinating. We appreciate it. Thank okay. you.